We have made church great again for people who are giving up on church. There is actually a simplicity in Christ Jesus. You don't come to God based on what he will do or based on what he is doing. You come to God based on what Christ has done. And the way to do that is by believing and accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. Before you sit down, put your hand on your chest. Say after me, I have the anointing in me. The teacher lives in me. I'm taught from inside, not just from outside. When I hear the right words, I know in my spirit, I receive those words. If I hear the wrong words, an alarm goes off in my spirit, I reject those words. It doesn't matter who is saying it. Well, somebody celebrate Jesus in the house. Hallelujah. Please take your seat. Hallelujah. Amen and amen and amen. Amen. I love Jesus. I love the gospel. Amen. Whenever we hear the gospel, it takes us to a new dimension in our, walks, in our walk with God. Can somebody say amen? amen? So today will not be different. In fact, we get better and better and better. Are you ready for the word of God? Amen. If you have a Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians 5. I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. We're going to start from verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Hallelujah. I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. It says in verse 14, it says, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. He said, For the love of Christ compels us. The old King James says, For the love of Christ constrains us. Oh, what does that mean? Number one, there are some things we want to do. What God stops us from doing, how does God stop us from doing them? It's, from the, it's by the love of Christ. There are some things we are supposed to do. God drives us to do those things. How God does, does God drive us? By the love of Christ. Amen. The love of Christ compels us. The love of Christ co- constrains us. So the reason why we do what we do is not because we are afraid of judgment day. Because we have experienced the love of God. It's not because we're afraid of judgment. I don't live the way I live because I'm afraid of hellfire. I can never go to hell. If I go to hell by mistake, I'll quickly be deported because I'm a citizen of another country. In fact, what I just said is a mistake because I can never go to hell by mistake. Somebody shout hallelujah. I'm a citizen of another country. It is practically impossible for me to go to hell. Now, I'm not going to hell because I'm good. The reason why I'm not going to hell is because Jesus is good. He's someone listening to me. I refuse to lean on Chinedu, but I lean on Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. For the love of Christ compels us. The love of Christ constrains us. What does it mean? What do we mean by the love of Christ? What is the love of Christ? It's small. It's not that difficult to. We all know John 3.16. He says, for God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Two things strike me uh, from there. Two simple things. Number one is value. Number two is the sacrifice. Say after me, say the value. Turn to somebody else and say the sacrifice. Now, what do I mean by the value? How much are you worth? You know, sometimes we measure how expensive, how valuable something is by how expensive it is, by how much we are willing to pay for it. For example, if I buy a simple pen, a simple pen, if I buy it for 50,000 naira or 100,000 naira, you say it must be valuable to him. Am I right? So sometimes you can determine value by how much somebody is willing to exchange for it. How much are you worth? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See, brothers and sisters in Christ, you are valuable. Your value is Jesus Christ. God paid Jesus to get you. How expensive are you? You are as expensive as Jesus Christ. That's why I tell people, I say I'm bloody expensive. It's the blood of Jesus that determines the worth that I have. 
It's all listening to me. There is nothing on earth. There is nothing above the earth. There is nothing beneath the earth as expensive as you. You are precious. Jesus is your prize. You are as expensive as Jesus Christ. God determined it. When God wanted to buy us, he, he gave his son Jesus. So everybody here, you are as valuable as the son of God. Talk to your neighbor and say, you are bloody expensive. Shout it out. Say, you are bloody expensive. And everything that is expensive, you handle with care. God has determined my value. Can somebody say amen? amen? That's why we can never have prostitutes amongst us. Because nobody can pay for you. You are too expensive. How much are you? That's why you cannot bribe me. Because I'm too expensive. I'm not that cheap. Anything that is expensive, you handle properly. See, I don't know about you growing up. Uh, I don't know. Well, there are ladies here. Whether it's a lady thing or a woman thing, I don't know. Growing up, I know your mo- you probably had a mother like mine. <laughs> or you have a mother like mine. And a wife like my wife. Growing up, my mother had special plates, china, all these special plates. To her, it's special. Or sometimes we don't even know why it's special. She had, I don't know if you have a mother like my own. You know, you don't dare use it except for special occasions or for special guests. Your mama be like my own. <laughs> now I'm married. My wife is like that. Why? I be, I be, leave it. Oh, leave it. Oh, leave it. Oh, this one is for. Sometimes the occasion will never even come that you are keeping it for. Are <laughs> you listening to me? Now, this is the point. Every special plate to my mom, she does not use anyhow. What's the principle? The principle is simple. Things that are special, you don't use anyhow. Oh, put your hand on your chest and say, I'm special, I'm special, I'm special. Now we know why the love of God constrains us. God has placed so much value on us. I'm not cheap. I'm special. So you have to handle me with care. And I have to handle myself with care. Can somebody say amen? amen. Special things. See, how many of you, you know, especially those of us that came from what we call the traditional orthodox churches. Even in our churches. How many of you here, you've ever been a part of a communion service? Let me see your hand. You've been a part of a communion service. <laughs> now, how many of you know <laughs> that during communion, most people, including me sometimes, maybe every time, we walk slow motion when we want to take the communion. <laughs> Answer me now. Nah. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You, you walk slow motion. God forbid the bread falling you are Jesus. When you want to take the wine, you walk slowly. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because it's special. <laughs> Would you go to a church that you see and they're having communion, the pastor throws the bread, eh, and he's catching it, eh, and he's catching it, eh, and he's catching it. Would you walk away? Because you know that the bread is not supposed to be treated like that. Can somebody say amen? amen. Now, but it's interesting. Now, we take the bread special. The, the wine, oh, say it symbolizes the blood. Special, we take it special. No problem. But do you know, or share you know, that that bread could have been made by an unbeliever? Answer me, nah. You know that that bread could have been made by an unbeliever. You know that that wine, especially the wine, the juice or the drink, could have been made by an unbeliever. Is it not possible? It's possible that at the market where they, you originally bought it, they were pushing the bread anyhow. BC put the bread on that side. Do you understand what I'm saying? With no honor. Are you listening to me? But when we come to church, it becomes special because it has been, we say in our hearts, that has been set apart for communion. Anything that is set apart for God is special. Anything that is set apart for God, dedicated unto God, is not meant to be used anyhow. The Bible tells us that we are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. Are you listening to me? Bible calls us an holy nation. Every believer has been dedicated to God. Every believer has been set apart unto God. We have been sanctified unto God. That's what King James calls it. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Because we have been set apart and sanctified, we handle ourselves with care. Now we understand that love has placed a value on us. 
That is why the love of God constrains us. Growing up in this city, I went to a secondary school that had some people from the palace. Where some of the princes, at that, the, some of the children of the Oba at that time were part of our school. And we noticed something. The Oba's children... They did not rush for meat pie outside. They didn't say, cut for me, cut meat pie for me. Give me meat pie now. You understand what I'm saying? You did, we did not expect the Oba's children to start fighting on it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Why? Because they were properly brought up and told that you are a prince. Prince do not act like this. Is someone listening to me? They don't act like this. See, brothers and sisters, we are not just the Oba's children. We are the king of kings' children. Are you listening to me? God has placed value on us with his love. That love, now we know why the love of Christ constrains us. Because it has placed value on us. Can somebody say amen? amen. Go back to 2 Corinthians 5.14. Very interesting. It says, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus. Or we thus judge. Depends on your translation. What is our judgment? That if one died for all, then all died. This is a very pregnant statement. If one died for all, then all have died now. What do we mean? Now, let me catch your jabotas here like me. How many of you here did your parents pay school fees for you? I know some of us pushed truck to get our school fees paid, amen. But it doesn't really matter, amen. Now you are awarded. Can somebody say Amen. But some of us, you know, our parents paid our school fees. I just want to catch your jabotas here. How many of you here, somebody has ever paid your school fees before when you were younger? Ah. Okay, we are many jabotas here, but not that many. Amen. I better raise your hand. If they paid your school fees for you before, let me see. Eh. Now, you remember that while you were in primary school and they are doing this school fees drive, and your parents paid school fees for you. Then the teacher comes to class and says, how many of you have paid your school fees? You say, Auntie, I have paid. How many of you remember? Now, when they ask this question, how many of you have paid your school fees? And your parents paid for you or somebody paid for you. You raise your hand and say, you have paid. But let me ask a simple question. Is it not your parents that paid for you? Why did you raise your hand and say you have paid? Now, it's simple. As far as they paid for you, you have paid. Answer me now. If they've paid for you, you have paid. Now we understand what Paul was saying. This is our judgment. If one died for all, then we have died. If Jesus died for me, then I've died. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Now, okay, what's the implication of that? Very simple, very simple implication. How many of you have heard this scary statement from Scripture? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. How many of you have heard that statement? How many of you have heard this statement? The wages of sin is death. Have you heard that statement? Now, those Scriptures are no longer in my future. They are in my past. Because 2,000 years ago, when Jesus died for my sins, I've died. The soul that sinned shall die has already been fulfilled. I died in Christ 2,000 years ago. The wages of sin is death has already been fulfilled. I died in Christ 2,000 years ago. So in my future, there's no fear of judgment. Now, what do you think will happen to you in your dimensions of your work with God when you know that there's no fear of judgment in your future? In my future and in your future, if you are a believer, there is no fear of judgment because I've already been judged. I was judged in Christ. And it's a miscarriage of justice to pay the same price twice if, if it was fully paid the first time. If the price has been paid, then I've paid. Tap your neighbor, say, fear not, Joe. Talk to your other neighbor, say, fear not, Joe. But say, on the last day, only true. Be- Calm down. See, the last day is our best day. Can somebody say amen? The only problem for us, like we normally say, thank God I don't marry now. No, Allah. Those who say, God, I, want you to, I don't want you to come till I'm married, you know. You know, 
I'm married, so he can come. Amen. Can somebody say, <laughs> Amen. But tap your neighbor and say, Fear not, John. See, stop all this. What do you think, assuming I'm here with my wife and maybe my daughter comes and you see me, maybe I came with them to this service and my daughter and my wife, they are crying. Jesus, Jesus. And you are wondering, ah, guess Mr. Wife, they cry. Yes, Mr. Pekin, they cry. What's happening? And they are crying. And you try to, you know, you are not, you are not supposed to do over sad. You say you know. But you hear something against me, sir. So you used that to draw clothes in the name of trying to pray, but it's just to hear what's happening. <laughs> then you hear my wife and daughter begging me. They say, oh, daddy, daddy, I pray. I want to make home after this meeting. Please, we will be worthy enough to go home with you. You will say this guy is an abuser. Not be better, Papa. Do you understand what I'm saying? How can your wife and children be hustling to make home? It's your house. There is no scripture, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, that tells believers to hustle to make heaven. None. There is no scripture in the whole Bible that tells us to try our best to make heaven. Heaven is not a bad that we make. The Bible says that we are seated in Christ in heavenly places where some of you are trying to make heaven. God says, no, you are looking down from heaven. Now heaven you day. Because wherever Jesus is, that's where I am. That's the mystery of being in Christ. I am in Christ. Just like a pregnant woman that has a baby inside. Wherever she goes, her baby is inside her. If she goes to America, the baby there America. If she goes to Ubo, the baby do Ubo. Wherever the mother goes to, the pregnant lady goes to, she carries what scientists call the fetus, what we call the baby. She carries the baby wherever she goes to. Can somebody say amen? amen. I am in Christ. Wherever, that's why I said, I said I died with Christ. You died with Christ. Where you did, you, you see Jesus. Wherever Jesus is, is my location. When he died, I died because I'm inside him. When he was buried, I was buried because I'm inside him. When he rose again from the dead, I rose again from the dead because I'm inside him. When he sat at the right hand of the Father, now there I did. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Colossians 3.3. We'll come back here. Colossians 3.3. You know, the King James starts with, for you are dead, something like that. <laughs> New King James, I'm reading from New King James, it says, for you died. You know, people don't like death. I, I was preaching in a congregation, I said, turn to anybody and say, for you are dead. He said, people said, well, yeah. <laughs> Nobody was there to say it. I said, it's not the Bible now. Turn to anybody and say, you are dead. Well, yeah. <laughs> Oh, let's read Colossians 3.3. I'm reading from New Kingdom. It says, for you died. Pigeon, you say you don't die. Can somebody say amen? <laughs> or I turn to anyone and say you don't die. <laughs> I can hear a wife say, don't tell me that one. No. <laughs> Colossians 3.3 says, for you died. <laughs> and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears that you also will appear with him in glory. We'll start with number one, for you died. See, when Jesus died, he killed you, you died. The Bible says the old man. Now, for young people here, I'm not talking about your father at home. Don't go and say, at E3, daddy, they say my old man don't die. That's not what we're saying. Your old man, the old man of the flesh is gone. That old man is dead. Can somebody say amen? amen. Put your hand in your chest and say, I died in Christ. Then say, I died with Christ. Hallelujah. He said, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So there's a new life is hidden with Christ in God. But let's see what this new life is. The life says, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory, 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 glory. When Christ, who is our life, I want you to scream this out and say, Christ is my life. 
Shout it out. Say, Christ is my life. Christ is my life. One more time. Christ is, life. Christ is my life. You know, when somebody says, see your life, you say, yes, it's Christ. When they say, see your life, you say, yes, Christ is my life. Then he says, <laughs> when Christ, who's our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Two things. Number one, how many of you know that Christ can never miss rapture? Answer me, nah. Christ is your life. You are dead. There's a new life. It's the life of Christ. The life that I have is Christ's life. For me to miss rapture, Christ will have to miss rapture. For me to miss judgment, or for me to be terrorized on judgment day, Christ will have to be terrorized. After all, the Bible says he's the head and the body. The head cannot be justified and the body condemned. Because if you condemn the body and justify the head, you condemn the head. You cannot say, I will not kill your head, I will kill your stomach. If you kill the stomach, you've killed the head. Christ is the head and the body. Whatever is the reality of Christ automatically becomes my reality. That's why I tell you, I always tell people, say, no fear. Those of us who are believers, we are not like unbelievers. We are not like unbelievers. For us, we have calmed down. Like we say, be coming down, be coming down. No wahala. Christ is our life. Christ is my life. But the good news is that when he comes, did you notice that he said that when he comes, we shall appear with him? What does that mean? There was a day, you know, those days, years, years ago, Benin Airport. Some of you were never even born because Obasanjo was president at that time. How many of you were alive when Obasanjo was president? Okay. <laughs> now, while Obasanjo was, while Obasanjo was president, he was scheduled to go to Asaba. But you know, at that time, there was no Asaba Airport at that time. So he had to come to Benin, then go to Asaba. We didn't even know he was coming through Benin because it was not announced that he was coming to Benin. Now, but this is the point I'm making. While he came to Benin, the entourage from Delta State were at the airport to receive him. Then they all came back or went back to Asaba. Do you understand what I'm saying? They met him at, quote-unquote, the gate, so to say, and they came back with him to Asaba. I remember there was a time, there was a man of God. I'll, if I, there is a man of God, actually. If I call his name, everybody here will know. You know, I was part of his campus fellowship at that time, and I was a pastor on campus. So there was a time he came to Benin. Now, all chapter pastors were supposed to enter the hall with him. Now, we didn't come with him, oh, at least I didn't come with him. But the idea was that all chapter pastors would come with him. You know, he's a, he's a revered man of God, you understand? So when the chapter pastor, when I came, I had to wait outside. So when he came, we joined his entourage. Are you listening to me? So they assumed that we all came with pastor. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the respect they gave him, you know, I just came, we all came. As he was coming, we all just came. We just came, we joined his entourage. Now, why am I telling you all this entourage story? The Bible says when he comes, we shall come with him. On the last day when Jesus comes, people will lift up their eyes and say, Jesus! Then my friend will say, ah, chinedu. Because when he comes, see, his arrival is our arrival. So we are the ones, if there's anything like terror, now we they terrorize people. If there's anything like that. Now we, now we come. When Jesus is coming down, that's why we say we'll meet him in the air. When Jesus is coming down, we are, we are coming down with him in style. So we are the part of the entourage of Jesus in the rapture you people are afraid of. We are part, rapture is the second coming of the body of Christ. Because the Bible tells us, John tells us, when he comes, we shall exactly be like him. That's what John said. We are like him, but it's not fully yet manifested. But when he comes, it's that day that will be fully manifested. That's when your boss will be sorry he treated you bad. 
Can somebody say amen? See, we have assurance. We work with boldness. Assurance of salvation. Let me give you one more. 1 John 4, 17. Maybe we'll start with 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. Hallelujah. And he who abides in love, abides in God, and God in him. Oh, God. Turn to anybody and say, God is love. Tell somebody else, say, God is love. See, I want to tell you something. It is practically impossible for God not to love you. The Bible doesn't say that God has love. The Bible says that God is love. The day God stops to love you, stops being God. Are you listening to me? Don't say you don't understand. I'm unlovable. You are not. There's no such thing as an unlovable person. Because our God is love. It is impossible for God not to love you. Practically impossible. Because that is who he is. Love has to love. You say, you don't know how bad I am. You don't know my God is love. You say, I'm unlovable. There is no such thing as an unlovable person. Now, yes, your father may not love you, or your mother may not love you, or your babe has stopped loving you. That's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about God. Whether you are good, though, he loves you. If you are bad, though, he doesn't want you to be bad, but he still loves you. Because that's who he is. There is no such thing as somebody who is not the beloved of God. No such thing. Thing. And his love does not decrease because his love. If his love decreases, that means God has decreased. And God cannot decrease. Hallelujah. Look at the next verse 17. Love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so we are in this world. Did you notice that love tells us to be bold on judgment day? All these teachings that judgment day is a terrible day is false doctrine. All these teachings on judgment day, oh God, but that's a, calm down. Our judgment is past. All this is judgment, calm down. This is the gospel. You know, we say the gospel is good news, but in our mind, we don't know it's really good news. Now, how do we illustrate this? This is very important. Now, something happened to me years ago, years, years ago, that makes me remember this concept of not being afraid. Because the next verse says, perfect love casts out fear. I used to struggle with that verse. We said that perfect love casts out fear. I used to struggle with it. I didn't understand it. Because I thought it, were, it meant my love for God. So I was saying, okay, I love God. Yeah, but I'm afraid sometimes. How can me loving God stop me from being afraid? I didn't understand. Till I read the context, I found I was talking about the love of God. I was talking about the day of judgment. Once you understand the love of God, as a believer, you will never be afraid of judgment. Never. Let me give you a vivid illustration. When I was much younger, years ago, I went to visit, I went on holidays to one of my auntie's house, houses. I just went to her house to visit her, you know, just to say small days holiday. And my dad's younger sister. So I went to her house. And she had the last boy now. The guy is a big boy now. But that time he was very small and rascally. So one day, unfortunately, they left only me and this rascal at home. Only two of us at home. Let me code name him Odaro. Code name. The guy's name, coded name is Odaro. So they left Odaro and I at home. Ha -ha. Very interesting. When they left, only me and Odaro. Odaro came and said, Uncle Chinedu is actually my cousin, but because of, you know, in Africa, we believe in respect. Can somebody say amen? The age gap difference, you understand? So he said, Uncle Chinedu, let's play a game. I said, what game is this? You know, as a visitor, I'm just trying to be nice. He said, let's play a game. What kind of game? He said, jump and catch. <laughs> Which kind of game be that? 
he will climb the dining table and jump. I'll have to catch him. And catching him makes it worse. After that, he will climb another thing and jump. I'll have to catch him. It got to a point I was tired of this jump and catch business. So I said, oh, Daru, if you jump again, eh, I'm not going to catch you. You will fall and break your leg. You will break your head. I'm tired of this, your jump and catch business. He looked at me and said, Uncle Chinedu, if I jump, you will not catch me. I just turned my back. I said, if you jump, eh, you will break your leg, break everything. He jumped, he just climbed the highest cupboard. Then he called out. He said, Uncle Chine, do I want to jump? <laughs> I said, oh, Daru, if you jump, I pretended as if I turned my back. He just jumped. I had to catch him. I had to catch him. <laughs> Why did he jump? Because I knew it was impossible for me not to catch him. Now we understand that perfect love Cast out fear. We know. <laughs> That's why David, after all the bad things, he said, Oh God, I pray that I fall into your hands. You know God. He said, Let me fall into the house of God, the terrible one. La lie. He knows the nature of God. See, eh? judgment day, because of his perfect love, no fear. God will never abandon his own. God is not an absentee father. He will never abandon his own. Never. Practically impossible. That's the gospel that we preach. One of the reasons we are not productive as believers is that believers are not assured of their salvation. You are going on evangelism. And you are preaching the gospel, so to say. You are telling about heaven and everything, receiving Jesus and everything. But you yourself, you don't know where you are going to. That's why, <laughs> you know, I love Jehovah's Witnesses. Because Jesus died for them. One came and made a mistake and started preaching to me. You know, the, the, the problem with me, you know, the, the, the difference between me and some people, I don't, like, I don't like argument. So it's not my business whether you want to stay on this earth, not in heaven. Me, I even prefer the earth, self. No, Allah. I, I, I didn't argue with the person. She talked and talked and talked and talked. I was just listening. And at the end, she asked him a question. She said, do you have any questions? I said, yes, I have a question. I said, this Jehovah's kingdom that you are working for, trekking under the sun and everything, carrying small bag, going up and down, no problem. Will you go to this, you yourself, will you go to this kingdom? Because, my own, I know why. I've stayed with Jehovah's Witnesses before. So any answer you give me in a trap, you enter. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I said, will you, will you go to this kingdom? She said, well, she's trying her best. And she's not sure. She's, she's trying her best. And maybe that Jehovah will accept her. Anything she had answered her, that she would have been in a trap. So she answered her. She said she would try. That Jehovah may accept her. So I saw this one, you are trekking on that song. You don't know where you they go. So I told her, I know they follow who know no road. Because common sense demands that I follow who know road. How can you be leading me to the kingdom you yourself you are not going to? Or you are not sure you are going to? Are you listening to me? That's one of the reasons why even believers, you go to church on a Sunday, the pastor says, hallelujah, we must all make heaven. Then the next Wednesday, the pastor will come and say, we must all make heaven. Then the next Sunday, the same pastor will say, even me, I'm not sure where I'm going to. Well, let's ask me, how can you not be sure where you are going to? Are you are preaching to me. See, I'm very practical. I see, I see, I consider, I love my enjoyment. Do you understand? If I'm not sure, I know they do. I don't fool myself. After everything, at the end, you go air fire. What is that? I will never follow a Christianity like that. Never. 
So it's better to be good. Even if you are, there's no heaven or no hell, at least you are good there. Nothing like that. How can you be preaching a salvation that you are not assured of? Just like the Amer- American ambassador. Because the Bible says we're ambassadors of Christ. Yeah, you now everybody's jabbering to Canada, to UK. People are just traveling out. Maybe your interview date has come. And for adventure, you met the American ambassador, the Canadian ambassador to Nigeria. And the Canadian ambassador tells you, why are you here? You say, I want to go to Canada for studies. The guy will look at you and say, yes, so say, that's true. Say, me too, I'm trying to go to Canada. Say, me too, I won't, I won't make, I won't jab. The ambassador, the ambassador, we're ambassadors of Christ, representatives of the kingdom of God. We are not arguing about whether we are making it. We are the one to give people visa. We are to issue the new citizens certif- uh, their passports. It's all listening to me here. I'll summarize with just this, the last verses. Romans chapter 5. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 5. We're going to read verse 8. We'll see the comparison that Paul gave in his epistle. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. It says, But God commendeth or demonstrate his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, we're going somewhere. That God demonstrates his love towards us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you know we have something better than Paul? Because Paul existed while Jesus died. I talk about physically speaking. But for us, we're not even born at that time. So we'll say, before we became sinners, Christ died for us. Before we became sinners, Christ died for us. So what does that mean? Very easy. I remember when I got married newly, I I annoyed my my wife. You know, ladies, you have to really understand them. You know, know, Ephesians tells us that Christ and the church is like unto um, husband and wife. Now I know why they called us wife, church. Very hard to understand sometimes. <laughs> you know, as a newly wedded man, we're somewhere, and I was hungry, but it wasn't yet time for real food. So I, I told my wife, are you hungry? She said, no. I said, do you need something? I want to get something. Do you want, I want to get something for you. Do you need something? She said, no. She's okay. I said, okay now. So I bought snacks only for myself. Only me just eating. And she was angry. I said, what? What did happen? She said, you are eating alone. I thought I told you I want to. I asked you. You said, no. See commotion. A new husband. I'm just... And I saw this marriage be. I don't understand. No matter how you explain, no evidence. No make sense. I said, I asked you if you were hungry. You said, no. I said, do you want to get something? You said no. Now I've gotten something for myself. You are angry. She said, how can you be eating alone? I don't understand. Now you say you know what job. <laughs> so one day I made her angry. I've even forgotten what I did to her that made her angry. You know, I made her angry. So, so I was apologizing as a good husband. Can somebody say amen? Yes. I apologized. I told her I'm sorry. Then she told me something. She said, before you apologize, I forgive you. I said, Wow. I said, why? She said, they told us in marriage counseling that trouble will happen in marriage. So I told myself, any trouble that will ever happen between me and my husband, I already forgive him ahead of time. My wife said, before you did it, I forgive you. The Bible says, before, or shows that before we were born, Christ made provision for our sins. Are you listening to me? See, sin is bad. Turn to your neighbor and say, sin is bad. In fact, say, sin is very bad. Don't think I'm trying to preach sin, God forbid. But this sin that you, that you committed, that you have killed yourself over, see, eh, let me tell you something. I know it's for me to say, you say I'm trying to, no, I'm not trying to make you sin, God forbid. But this sin 
that you committed. He no shock God. Before you were born, he no say you go sin now. The only time you would have shocked God if you did not commit the sin. Before you were born, he has seen all the sins you ever commit. So now they act like say you shock Jesus. Say Jesus, I don't know. I'd... Calm down. I knew before you were born. I knew. I know. Say you go do him. Now you now <laughs> now yourself you shock. So don't be killing yourself as if God is saying, Jesus, look at what this one did. Imagine. Before you were born, you have seen everything. So calm down. Don't see no, but if you sin, accept his forgiveness. Amen. <laughs> Verse 9 says, much more then. Talk to anybody and say, much more. In other words, what I just said just now, there is something better than it. Can somebody say, Amen. Having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Having now been justified, been justified. You know, this verse is for those of us who teach that salvation is not, uh, that you, you make it in rapture. So people say, I know you are born again now, but that doesn't mean that when Jesus comes, you are going. So we are praying for one and say, remain rapturable. What is remain rapturable? The Bible says, having now been justified, present tense, you shall be saved, future tense. So if you are justified now, you shall be saved. It's not, it's not preaching, it's not you shall will be saved. You shall be saved. Neither is it Yoruba, it's not you shall will be saved. It's you shall be saved. Definite. If you are saved now, when he comes, you shall be saved. Period. There is no such thing as believers going to hell. No such thing. Christians don't go to hell. No such thing. No such thing. As far as you have faith in Christ, you cannot be lost. Now, if you stop having faith, I don't know. I cannot preach. I don't feel preach with you. I don't know. But the one I know is this. As far as you have faith in Christ, he will never forsake you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, the rest I don't know. But if you have faith, you cannot be lost. Think about it. If God accepted you as an enemy, is it now that you are his friend that he will chase you away? We tell unbelievers, come the way you are. Abby, we tell them, come the way you are. Is it now, when they were enemies, we said, come the way. Is it now that you are a son of God? I'll end with verse 19 of Romans 5. 19 says, therefore, as though one man's, for it, as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also, by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Oh, those are powerful words. Those are powerful words. Let me give an example. Now, I know you are not going to believe the next statement I'm going to make, sure, but by faith, believe it. While I was in secondary school, I could play football. Can somebody say amen? amen. Don't look at me like this. You know, in JSS, I was called Chichidona. Can somebody say Amen. amen. Oh, some of you don't know Maradona. Don't, don't worry. It's only Ronaldo and Messi that you know. Don't worry. There's a man called Maradona. Hallelujah. They named me after him on the field. I was called Chichi Dona. Can somebody say amen? amen? And I want you to repent of your own belief. The way you are looking at me, you don't trust. <laughs> now, assuming Nigeria, Nigeria, I, I love to go to Ghana. But I, I, my mini, I, in fact, I, I, I'm... Ghana is, Ghana is part of my ministry. So I was so excited when during the choir they were mentioning a song in, in the Ghanaian language. You know, I love Ghana. So let me use Ghana for example. Amen. <laughs> Assuming Nigeria is playing football match against Ghana. And unfortunately, at that time, they are beating us. Maybe first half. They are beating us in first half. You know, maybe I'm watching with my wife. Can I not say that they beat us? 
Can't I say that? If they are beating us. I can say, they are just beating us. So maybe my wife is not around. I say, these boys, they win us. So do you understand? I can say that. But assuming I was, in, I was watching live, I was in the stadium, and my chichidona instinct kicks off. Then I beat all the policemen, jump the fence, the gate, that this is a prison, enter the field, take the ball, dribble every ball, dribble all the Ghanaians, and score. Is it a goal? Answer me now. Is it a goal? Am I not a Nigerian? I, I, I dribble everybody and score. Is it, is it a goal? It's not a goal. Why? Because I'm not representing Nigeria. Can somebody say amen? amen? I'm not representing Nigeria. Thank you. Because I'm not representing Nigeria. But if they score, I can say we don't score. Answer me now. Why can I say we don't score? But I was not part of them now. Because they are representing us. It is only the goals of the representative that counts. Let me give an example. There are Bible students here. How many of you remember Adam and Eve's story? You know, the Bible says by one man, one man's disobedience. Not one man and woman's disobedience. So. Only one man. No. But Eve was there. Oh. Let me ask a simple question. Who ate the quote-unquote forbidden fruit first? Not be Eve. When Eve ate the fruit, the man fell. Man only fell when Adam ate the fruit. Why? Is it women liberation? <laughs> yes, because Adam was representing man. No matter how it ate the fruit, mankind did not fall. Jesus is our representative. By one man's obedience, Many are made righteous. So for me to fall, Jesus has to fall. Since Jesus cannot fall, it's impossible for me to fall. I'm not standing on my works. I'm standing on his obedience. The Christian stand is on the obedience of Christ. The Christian stands on the obedience of Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when we say Jesus is our Savior, we mean it. We're, we're not paying lips. We're not saying with our mouth that Jesus is our Savior. Yeah, with our heart, we believe that we are the ones saving ourselves. No. When we say Jesus is our Savior, we mean it. Our salvation from beginning to the ending, now Jesus is the dwell. I'm told that we can take questions, amen. But before we take the questions, so as I just know I've, I've wrapped up, I just want you to just bow down your heads where you are. You know, first of all, in just three minutes, I'm going to pray for the sick. Because wherever I teach the gospel, and whenever I teach the gospel, by the grace of God, people get healed. It happens. It's, it's, it's not because I'm too much. It's just a gift. Now, Jesus, they do. Can somebody say amen? amen? So, if you are sick in this place, this is your day. Because Jesus is here. Jesus is here. Now, I'm, I'm going to make it fast. You know, so I'm going to, I, I'll just pray for people. Don't worry, I won't take time. It won't take more than three minutes. Now, I'm going to quickly pray for, I'm dividing the body into three categories. That's the way I like to do it. If you, are, if you have a pain or a problem from your neck up, I want you to stand up while everybody's sitting down. If you have any problem from your neck up, maybe you have a pain in your ear or you have migraine headaches that usually come or you have something in your eyes. Uh -huh. Thank you, my brother. If you have any problem, usually from your neck up, I'm going to pray like that and I'll just take it down. Maybe your head or something. Your eyes, your ears, especially if you have a problem hearing from one ear. If you are in this place, you have a problem hearing from one ear, you'll be healed automatically. That one, no, no, forget that one. you just be well. So I want to quickly do that. So if you know you have a problem from your neck up, I want you to stand up from your neck up. 
Okay? Now, put your hands where you have that problem. You know, you are, we're going to pray for you, and you're going to be well. Now, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke infirmity. I rebuke infirmity. I command the head pain to go. It releases you now in the name of Jesus. I command the neck pain to go. In the name of Jesus, your neck is healed. I command the ear ache. If you cannot hear well from one ear, today is your day. I command your ears open. In the name of Jesus. Your eyes are going to see clearly from your eyes. See better from your eyes. In the name of Jesus. Every ache from your neck up. I command it healed in the name of Jesus. Receive healing now in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can sit down but start testing. You see that it's well. Just sit down. Now if you have any problem from your chest to your waist, stand up. There are people here who have back pain. I, I can sense from your back. If you have any problem from your chest to your waist down, even if it's a back issue, you have a reoccurring back problem, this is your day. This is your time. If you have a problem, you know, there's somebody here, you checked your breast and you, you start feeling as if there's a lump and you are scared. Don't worry. The lump will disappear this morning. Amen. There's somebody actually like that. You, you said check, uh, you were like, ah, what will it be this? So what will it be this? It will disappear this morning. You can even check it up, go to the doctor. You'll be surprised what you're going to see. No problem. In a, so if you have any problem from here down to your waist, now, in the name of Jesus, I command infirmity to release you. I command infirmity to go in the name of Jesus. Back pain, go. If, if you have back pain, just begin to bend. The pain is gone. The one in the back pain, the deep down is gone. I command you gone in the name of Jesus. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Stomach pain, go. I command you to go in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now begin to test yourself. Well, you, you are healed. You can have your seat. Now the remaining part of your body from your waist down. In fact, I feel that there's somebody who have a problem with your feet. Just get up. If you have a problem with your waist, waist down, yes, thank you, from your waist down, especially if you have a problem with your feet, amen, your knee, somebody, your knee, I'm, I'm going to pray for you, thank you. In the name of Jesus, every pain under the sound of my voice, I rebuke you, go in the name of Jesus. Pain, go in the name of Jesus. Then everybody from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet are going to recover. Be healed now in the name of Jesus. Now everybody rise to your feet. Everybody rise. Hallelujah. Just wave your hands and thank God for the miracles. Wave your hand and thank God for the miracles. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Now I want to make one more call. One more call. Now, if you are in this place, don't worry, we're not going to take time. If you are in this place, you know in yourself that you are not born again yet. You know you are not born again. You know. And you want to receive Christ. You've heard that it's simple, it's not hard. That's number one. Number two, prior to this session, you know you are here, you are not assured of your salvation. Um, you felt backsliding. You feel that you've backsliding. You know, but you want to come back, quote unquote, come back and say, Jesus, I'm sorry. You know, so if you are in that any of those two categories, just raise your hand. If you feel backsliding, just raise your hand. Or if, if you are not born again and you want to be born again in this place, hallelujah. Okay, I can see some hands at the back. Or is it the children? Okay, but if you are in that um, position, I want you to lift up your hands, amen. Be bold about it, be bold about it. Thank you. There's a lady in front. Amen. Now, if tell her to just tap her to tell her to come forward. Amen. Just come forward. Relax. You know, God's arm. Um, and I'm on. You just come. If your hands are raised, just come forward quickly. Okay. It's a, if your hands are raised, just come forward. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. If you're in this place, you feel backsliding, like you want to um, to make a public declaration of Christ, just come forward. Hallelujah. Or if you're in this place, you know that you are not born again and you want to get born again, just quickly come forward. Hallelujah. 
we'll wait for you. Quickly come forward. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, physically speaking, Nigeria is celebrating their independence. You know, but today we are declaring freedom from the bond of Satan. Freedom from Satan and freedom unto Christ. Hallelujah. Now, I will just wait a few seconds. If you need to join them, please join them. You know, it's not something to be ashamed of. You know, Christianity has a lot to do with public declaration for Christ. We'll just wait, wait one or two seconds. If you want to join them, please join them. Respond quickly. Just join them. Hallelujah. Respond quickly. Hallelujah. Now, for those of you in front, I'll just give you a little bit of instructions. You know, I'll just give you a few instructions. Number one is what all of us should know. Number one, you cannot save yourself. I know that some of you have received Christ before. But you say, I don't mess up again. You know, the truth is that you cannot save yourself. You can't. So your Christianity is not based on what you can do or you cannot do. You cannot save yourself. That's the truth. That's number one. Number two, Jesus has done everything to save you. He came as a man. He hung on the cross. He rose again from the dead. He's now seated at the right hand of the Father. He has done everything to save you. So stop struggling to be saved. Jesus has done everything to save you. He's done it. Then number three, your response is to say, thank you, Jesus. It's not to do it, just to accept what he did. You understand what I'm saying? So never again struggle to be saved. Jesus has done everything to save you because he came as a man. He hung on the cross. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again from the dead. He's now sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. That's what the Bible says. So he's done everything to save us. So you are going to say a prayer after me. Now, everybody will say this prayer. I'm going to craft it in a way that even believers can say it. So it's for them, it's a declaration of their faith in Christ. For us, it's also a confession of faith. So we are, I'm going to word it in a way that all of us can say it. Amen. So say after me, I believe in my heart. Oh, say it so that your ear will hear you. Shout out and say, I believe in my heart. And I declare with my mouth that Jesus died for my sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. I declare that Jesus is the Lord of my life. I boldly declare that Jesus is the Lord of my life. I declare that he's my savior. I declare that he's my savior. I declare that the spirit of God is mighty in me. In Jesus' name I pray. Will somebody celebrate Jesus in the house? Amen. We have made church great again for people who are giving up on church. There is actually a simplicity in Christ Jesus. You don't come to God based on what he will do or based on what he's doing. You come to God based on what Christ has done. And the way to do that is by believing and accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior.